for the tribes that fought in these wars, the Wampanoag, as well as the neighboring communities of like the Nipmuc. A lot of this history is, is still really real. Modern Americans, a lot of us are removed from these wars because it's so distant, but for a lot of the communities, it's it's not. It's, it's something that's still being perpetrated on them today. I'm very much someone who believes in partnership and believes in collaboration and believes in sharing because that's the only way to peacefully coexist. But I think for a lot of communities, you know, that land which belongs to you doesn't belong to you. You're still sharing it. And I think that does leave a bitter taste in your mouth. King Philip's war was less of a war than it was a sudden outbreak of widespread violence. And in pandemonium like that, there is little use for grand strategy. There were no long-term paramount military commanders in this war, no one analogous to Ulysses S. Grant or Douglas MacArthur. Most captains, whether English or native, had no direct control over anyone but their own small, proximate companies of troops. In fact, from a devout Puritan perspective, the idea of any one person trying to steer the course of the conflict one way or the other seemed like an insolent attempt to interfere in God's preordained plan. The contemporary histories of King Philip's War were all written by Puritan clergymen. Chronicler Increase Mather was almost completely uninterested in military tactics and strategies, except where it suited the theological lesson he wished to impart on his readers. In Mather's mind, the indigenous enemy was nothing more than an instrument of Satan, permitted by God to kill colonists and destroy settlements as punishment for New England's sinful ways. This selective focus, as well as Native War Party's vested interest in carefully concealing their movements from the English, has made it extraordinarily difficult to chart the military history of King Philip's War from the indigenous perspective. But I'd still like to try, and to that end I've enlisted expert help. This is really the build-up of you know, years after years of years after wrongdoing and really just the overall encroachment of Europeans in not just land, but also in the native way of life. They're trying now to convert people and change them and tell them what they can and can't do in their own land and the land that they gave to the Europeans. And really it's the last push by the native population, I'd say, of New England as a whole um, against European encroachment and Europeans really trying to col uh, colonize them and take over their way of life and control them. Dylan Smith and Drew Shuptar Ravis are living historians of native descent in New England, their tribal heritages hailing from the mid-Atlantic. Dylan's father's family is Shinnecock and Montauk. A former Plymouth Plantation interpreter, he currently works for a language and culture program on the Kahnawake Mohawk Reservation in Quebec. Drew is a cultural ambassador of the Pocomoke Indian Nation. He has a background in archaeology and anthropology, and travels all over the Northeast giving lectures on 17th and 18th century Native American history. One thing I try to tell people with 17th century, there are no good guys and there are no bad guys. And you cannot conceptualize the world in your modern perspectives of good and right and wrong, because these are people who did not live in the reality that you live in. Um, and people make decisions on what was beneficial at the time. You know, we might argue, well, why didn't the, I'm sure you've heard this too, why didn't the natives do this? Why didn't they do that? And say, well, you had to make decisions for your community. You had to make decisions that kept people alive. And they were they gallant? Were they noble? Probably not, but it kept people alive for another season. I met Drew through the production of my movie, The Sudbury Devil, which he appears in, in a brief but vital role. There's Drew in the rough cut of The Sudbury Devil. Look at him, he's a freaking movie star. Later, when I got back in touch with Drew and asked him to help me make this video, he kindly invited Dylan to come along and offer his expertise as well. The three of us met in a backyard in Pennacook country, just up the hill from the historic town of Haverhill in Massachusetts. In the late 17th century, natives and Europeans fought bitterly over this very land, in these very woods. It seems very fitting that we would film here. Since Dylan and Drew came tricked out in 17th century warrior's kit, I just knew I had to ask them to tell me all about native clothing of the period. So the way I'm dressed is what you would have seen in the late fall or early winter of 1675-76. I have a boot-style moccasin. They come up to about, oh, about past my ankle. 
up to start the beginning of my leg. Um, and these wrap around and they wrap around, they're insulated with pieces of wool. We know by the 1670s, wool has already been a trade item since the early 1620s. Um, well, and I noticed that there's like, you know, that, that for your outfit specifically, there's a bit of a fusion of like right. indigenous and European right like materials and styles, and so like, Exactly, yeah. and we know that in Southern New England by this time period, there's a real big fusion between native clothes and European clothes. Yeah. There's, you know, there's native guys with hats and with coats, riding horses, as well as guys in breech cloths and in leggings, and we have documentation for both. Uh, so, Drew, uh, tell me about your underpants. Sure, I'm not really wearing underpants as you would know them. Um, I am wearing a breech cloth. My breech cloth, which covers my front and my back, it's made of duffel cloth. So duffel is a really important fabric of the yeah. 17th century. It's one that's recorded as early as the 1620s. And duffel is this thick, coarse woven woolen cloth. It's a dense fiber that can get wet, but will, cons but will consistently insulate you, mm. even when it's really, really wet. So it'll constantly give you warmth and protection, and it's why wool is really important. Also, lastly, the color. Electric reds like these are things that you can't really find in nature. You can find yeah. burnt reds, burnt oranges, yeah. um, and things that are very close to this type of red, but not this electric. Yeah. And so red is one of those things that for some Eastern people symbolizes the East, the Wapan, the, the Dawnland, mm -hmm. where the sun rises, yeah, yeah, yeah. blood, life, mm -hmm. vitality. And speaking of kind of European influence, I mean, that shirt is right. a European shirt. So we can document shirts really, really early. Um, I can... For my own tribal community, I can document shirts as early as the late 1500s. It does protect you from the elements. It will keep you warm, mm -hmm. but it's also a status symbol too. Look who I trade with, look who I, what I yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, exactly. um, and we know by the 18th century, some of these shirts are gonna be very decorated with trade silver and other things that are gonna show more of that status. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that my shoulders on this shirt are painted red. And when you would paint your face and paint your body, which was a very normal custom, well, your hands are covered in paint. Yeah, yeah. So where do you wipe them? Well, you wipe them on the shoulders of your shirt. Yeah. And we do know there's recordings of these shirts that have these reddened that's shoulders. Nice. Oh, that's a great little detail. Yeah, yeah. So uh, moving on to the stabby stuff, uh, uh, what can you tell us about this knife? Right. So this knife was made by Ken Hamilton, who's a pretty well-known living historian and researcher. Knives were so important for Native people. Prior to Europeans, we were making knives from chipped flints and shirts, um, even sharpened bone can be used as a knife. Yeah. Copper, we know, is even being used for high status knives and knife blades. Yeah. Um, but when Europeans came, one of the things they brought with them was iron and steel. They brought this metallurgical yeah. culture mm -hmm. that native people really didn't have outside of cold hammering copper. Um, and copper, though, can make a sharp edge. It's limited. It won't stay that sharp, and it's very easy to, it's very malleable. Yeah. So it won't hold that edge for a long time. So knives are one of those things that really was a game changer for our ancestors, that knives are one of those things that, you know, you could process game, you could cut fish, you could carve wood, green and dry wood, because yeah, yeah. prior to that with stone tools, you're kind of limited to really carving and cutting green wood yeah. because dry wood will break stone tools. Mm -hmm. um, so knives like these were one of the things that we see all the time in trade documents and ledgers mm -hmm. uh, when native people are selling land or when they're making treaty agreements or when they're doing all these different things and these things are recorded. Knives are usually always part of the deal. I have to say the probably the most striking aspect of your impression is your jewelry. I do have wampum beads. Wampum is incredibly crucial and important to Algonquian people. Um, it is a living object to us. It is made from the quahog clam. It is also made from the whelk shell. Uh, the center column of the whelk makes beads and also the quahog shell, the lip, and also the side walls make beads. Wampum was used for everything, for births, marriages, deaths. It had a lot of social and sacred significance. Um, it's a term I use for it, socio-spiritual significance, both having That's significance in society, but also significance in spirituality, but it's intertwined because the spirit and social life is the same. Well, and it's interesting that, you know, I mean, I think for, you know, uh, the sort of lay person's understanding of wampum is just, oh, it's Indian money. And do you know, you know where that and, comes from? Uh, I don't actually. That's from the Dutch. So when the Dutch oh, okay. come here, they're limited in what currency they can use and bring over. And so they know that the native people value wampum. This happens all around Fort Amsterdam, which is New York City today. And what happens is they know the native people value wampum and they value beaver furs. And so they make a de facto currency using wampum as a de facto currency to get around the fact that they don't have a lot of their own currency to bring into the new world. Totally. Yeah. And the Dutch actually make legal, they make a lot of laws, and you can look into the legal records of the Dutch where they're actually fined in wampum beads. And yeah, they actually yeah. have 
an entire monetary status of the value yeah. of black and white beads. Totally. It's like kind of a mixed economy in that way. Right. Well, and there's also, you know, I think there's also something to be said that uh, I think the, the comparison, even though it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, it is kind of apt because, uh, you know, <laughs> you could argue that, that, that sort of currency, money, had a lot of socio-spiritual importance to Europeans sure, at the time. You know, there, there was a, and, you know, I mean, and a lot of these entrepreneurial sorts who came here, you know, they were in it for a buck. And, right. and yeah, yeah. And we had no concept of cur currency in the ways that European had. We had that made absolutely no sense to us. Yeah. So Dylan, uh, I'm very curious about what you're wearing and I'm especially curious about your tattoos. What can you tell us about your impression here? So we'll start with the tattoos. Tattoos are heavily traditional. Um, you know, people are tra tattooing way before European contact and it continues after European contact. Um, once people start to really um, be colonized and put into Christian societies, the tattoos start to die out a little bit. Um, definitely, um, but modern days, a lot of uh, modern native people have really made a resurgence with traditional tattoos. That's cool. So, and uh, so I think uh, another thing that you know we immediately noticed when you guys got uh, dressed up was that Drew is dressed for the weather, which is not the warmest right now, uh, and you're practically naked, Dylan. So, <laughs> what's, yeah. what's up with that? Um, Why did you decide to suffer for a YouTube video? I guess it's um, personal preference. Uh, a lot of times, natives are recorded wearing a lot less clothing than their European counterparts, um, and that often shocks them, right? Mm. Um, your body does acclimate to the weather. I am outside a lot. Um, and previously have come from Canada, so this is actually really warm to me, so it's not that cold out to me. But um, also working in the field that I have working at museums, this is how I'm dressed most of the time, so you do get really used to it. When you're, you have to think, most of the people are uh, living a pretty active lifestyle. You're moving around, you're not really sitting around too much. You're gonna be pretty warm throughout most of the day in a temperature like today, it's around 50 degrees, I think. Um, so you're gonna be generating a lot of body heat and you're gonna be pretty good. You know, um, a lot of people do wear shirts. Shirts are a huge trade item as well. So it's really personal preference. I um, tend not to wear a shirt as much as other people might wear a shirt. Yeah, um, yeah just, you know, just in the in the Duncan, you know, just, yeah. you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, what can you tell us about the, uh, uh, about some of your clothing? Like uh, you got uh, your big fur, uh, fur blanket on there. Yeah, so during the time period that we're talking about, King Philip's War period, you're gonna see a lot of European trade blankets, definitely. Wool blankets are the main ones made out of duffel cloth it's a nice warm uh, material as well as this water resistant a little bit too which is nice but you still do see the fur blankets we know that especially um, blankets made of beaver furs exist all the way up until the 18th century as well as some of deer furs and stuff like that you do see some of them painted so mine here is painted as you guys can see um, and this painting is something that you see on blankets, like I said, 17th century, 18th century. This one here is a white-tailed deer fur, and you guys can see this one's painted here with natural pigments, so um, fish row, um, black ochre, red ochre, yellow ochre, as well as you can use black fur um, with uh, charcoal and other things of that nature. Um, some of the other things that I have on here is um, my knife sheath, it's quilled. This is all done with porcupine quills, as well as my bag here. This one here is decorated with porcupine quills as well. Hawk bells, which are huge trade items, and wampum. So, um, you do see more quill work in the 18th century. We don't have many surviving examples of quill work in the 17th century, but it is one of those art forms that is um, uniquely native, and it's most likely that it was around in the forms that you see on me in some way, shape, or form during the 17th century, especially the later 17th century. The demonstration of native clothing was fascinating, but now it was time to move on to the most important part of historical reenacting, running around in the woods playing with dangerous weapons. So the mainstay of any 17th century North American battlefield was, of course, the flintlock musket. What can you tell us about this, Drew? All right, so we have two different muskets that are here. The one that I have is probably the closest to the period um, for 1675-76. This is a Type 2 Dutch trade musket. It dates to around 1640 to 1660, and it's an early internal flintlock. And what I mean by internal flintlock is that everything that goes from half cock, which is your safety, to full cock, which means you're ready to fire, everything is happening inside. There is no external pieces that take this from being at rest to half cock. It's all happening with inside 
the, the piece. Um, and that's really important. The English are still using a mechanism called a dog lock that has a little piece of metal that hitches in the back, holds it in place, um, and then what that releases when you pull it to full cock. The Dutch and the French were very advanced in their firearms, um, and they were, they were doing these things very early on. One of the things you have to remember with native people is that we were acquiring firearms very, very early. Um, we can document firearms, at least in the mid-Atlantic, into the 1640s uh, with Keefe's War, which is 1643 to 45. Um, we can document also firearms into the 1650s, 1660s, and by the 1670s, we know in Maryland, the Piscataway tell the government of Maryland that they don't even know how to make bows and arrows anymore, that they are so dependent on using muskets, and they required them because they were defending the borders of Maryland, and they said, we need powder and shot for our muskets because we are very much out of practice of making bows and arrows. So, I mean, Drew, the one thing that any military history nerd can tell you about King Philip's War is actually indigenous firearms were more advanced at first than English firearms. Absolutely true tidbit. Native people were far better armed than Englishmen. And the reason why, number one, Dylan and I aren't part of any militia. We don't qualify to be part of any militia. All we need is an ex-soldier, a trader, a merchant to teach us how to use this firearm or a farmer to show us how to use this firearm and teach us. And now we can use it. And we also, I don't have to go to any government official. I don't have to go to a governor. I don't have to go to a, um, a general or any kind of military or public official to acquire a firearm. You have to remember in Europe, hunting was, it was something that was done by nobility. And so your average European really was not trained in musketry. They were not trained in firearms. There's actually uh, records that we have of Europeans sending letters back to Europe saying, bring us musketeers, bring us people trained in musketry to teach us how to use muskets because these were farmers. They weren't allowed to use firearms. They couldn't afford them. Muskets were very expensive. Um, and so they needed people, they needed soldiers to come in to teach them how to use, and military people from Europe, this is why Miles Standish, John Smith, that's why they're very important people, because they teach the local people how to use muskets, how to drill, how to do all these things. Uh, but as native people, we didn't have to go through any of that. Uh, all we had to do was learn how to use it and acquire it. And there was many different ways of acquiring firearms. The English had laws against the sale of powder and shot for a while with native people, same with firearms, that were the prohibition of sale, which makes a lot of sense when you have a populace of people that don't like you at all, and now you're arming them with weapons that are better than yours, because the traders, they had no laws. They could give native people whatever they wanted, whether it was alcohol or firearms, if that's what native people, when they brought their furs to trading posts or brought them to ships where they were trading on board ship, didn't matter. They were getting the best of the best that Europe could produce, where your average Englishman is getting whatever the armory has, whatever is, is there. One of the things that was done with firearms was ornamentation. So if I turn this musket around, this does have a wampum inlay that is put into it. But also you might have seen ornamentations on the locks. You might have seen people hanging things that were reminiscent of their clans or animals that they wish to acquire or hunt in life such as this deer toe, which might be to call the deer and to bring the deer forward to the gun, the bear claw for strength and to have that medicine energy, um, and turtle paws to symbolize that you're a person living upon the turtle's back, that you live upon the world, but also beads to ornament this gun, to ornament, you know, who, who are you trading with? Where are you coming from? And also just to stylize your own individual piece. So guys, I actually have a ballistic gel torso for us to demonstrate some of these weapons on. Uh, would you like to go see? Of course. Great. Come on over. So uh, this is the torso that we're going to be demonstrating these weapons on. Uh, this is Jonathan from the YouTube channel, The Far Off Station. Hi, everyone. I'm just... Shut really... up, Jonathan. Shut up. So um, he, here he is in his very... He's going to be our Englishman in this very authentic polyester coat. As you can see the detail on that. Um, so, uh, guys, how would you go about uh, murdering this Englishman with these muskets? Um, I mean, I think you know what we what we what we know through documentation is that muskets, Englishmen like this would be killed at a distance, and so gotcha. they would kill, be killed ambush style. This is recorded through Benjamin Church. There's 
yes, you you know, these are known as um, belly muskets because of the belly of the stock. And so obviously once it stops working, you can use it as a club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just right, you could do it right you know, here. Yeah, right here. Oh yeah, perfect. Yeah, right there. Right just, there. you know, you can break or the jaw. he's on you know, the ground. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Yeah, right there, right Over there. Stop, the stop squirming, Jonathan. Stop squirming. All right, um, uh, that's, honestly, that's perfect. Uh, uh, how would you kill him, Dylan? I mean... Once we got our shot off here in close quarters, you know, you could use the barrel or part of the stock or anything like that. Press it against his neck. If he's on the ground, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and just, just strangle him, just like break his windpipe. Mm -hmm. well, That'd course. be a good way to do it. That'd be good. Eye to eye. Eye to eye, yeah, exactly. Well, and uh, it's funny you should say at a distance, Drew. Um, why, don't we, why don't we put that into action? Run, Englishman, run, run. <laughs> All right, uh, let's murder him. No Englishmen were harmed in the making of this documentary, but of course the same cannot be said for the events of King Philip's War itself. In 1675 and 76, indigenous warriors fought ruthlessly in defense of their homeland, relying on the tried and true tactics of stealth and ambush. Sadly, there are no native written accounts describing combat in King Philip's War, so we'll have to content ourselves with consulting the memoirs of their enemies. This account by Massachusetts Bay Captain Thomas Wheeler describes how a force of Nipmuc warriors melted out of the woods to decimate the militiamen under his command near Brookfield in the summer of 1675. The way was so very bad that we could march only in a single foil, there being a very rocky hill on the right hand and a thick swamp on the left, in which there were many of those cruel, bloodthirsty heathen who their way laid us, waiting an opportunity to cut us off. There being also much brush on the side of the said hill, where they lay in ambush to surprise us. When we had marched there about six day or seven day rods, the said perfidious Indians sent out their shot upon us, as a shower of ale. We, seeing ourselves so beset, and not even room to fight, endeavoured to fly for the safety of our lives, in which flight we were in no small danger to be all cut off. There being a very miry swamp before us, into which we could not enter with our horses to go forwards. There being no safety in retreating the way we came, because many of our enemies who lay behind the bushes had let us pass by him quietly. When others had shot, they came out and stopped our way back, so that we were first as we could to get up the steep and rocky hill. The tactic was simple, but devastatingly effective. Funnel the English into a bottleneck, launch a surprise attack, envelop the disoriented enemy, and destroy them in detail. If the ambush was well-timed, it was almost unbeatable. Indigenous forces went on to set near-identical traps at Bloody Brook and the Sudbury fight, widely considered the greatest native victories of the war. Given the similarities, it may be that all three of these perfect ambushes were executed by the same formidable band of Nipmuc warriors, possibly those led by Mudawump, sachem of the Quabog Nipmuc, the war's most powerful and aggressive native commander. But while launching an ambush, muskets can only get you so far. At some point, you need to get up close and personal. And in King Philip's War, native warriors prized two melee weapons above all others. Now this is a really fearsome looking weapon, uh, an Algonquian War Club. Tell us yes. about it. So this one right here, and I brought two today that are um, documented roughly around these time periods are from the King Philip's War. This one specifically is probably one of the most common types of uh, weapons amongst the uh, Eastern Woodlands. It's your typical ball club. This one's a little bit different as the ball itself is more of an egg shape or a flat head. Um, a lot of the times they're balled off, look more like a baseball, a large baseball or something like that. Um, this one is decorated as well. You see them during the time period being uh, carved with different designs in them, or also maybe burnt in as well, but also different shell inlays and later bead inlays and other things of that nature as well. This one right here has wampum inlay in it so you guys can see all the different beads laid in there on, on both sides. And this one is a remake of the club that King Philip uh, himself carried. This is your go-to for close quarters combat. It's, um, you know, a blunt force trauma weapon. It's good for taking out people. Um, usually you're probably gonna tr uh, try and strike the head, but also body blows and other areas. This can do some serious damage as well as um, immobilize your opponent as well if your um, goal is maybe not to kill them. It's definitely gonna do some uh, damage on other body parts as well, so. So it'll be uh, good for like taking captives and yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. And what is this club? 
So this is the other type of club that is documented around the same time period. This one is attributed to the Mohawk as well, um, not instead of the Wampanoag or other surrounding communities involved in King Philip's War. Um, this one is a rough remake of the original club as well. The original club has almost like a bear um, at the end here with its grip, and it's almost like a sword shape or a saber shape. Um, would that be like inspired at all by European designs, or is that just kind of a natural sort of thing that you would come to as it, a good there, shape for a weapon? It very much could be. There mm. are some that people kind of uh, later in time periods definitely say probably are, but there are other types of clubs that are either flat um, or almost sword shaped that are probably not uh, reminiscent of European um, contact or influence as well. Um, the one that is historically accurate has a lot of shell inlay and it also has a effigy of the person that probably was the owner of the club almost like a calling card so a lot of these clubs are personal um, the decoration is very personal maybe um, talks about the tribe or the nation or clan that person is from maybe has some uh, spiritual significance as well in the different carvings and decorations as well as showing who that person is so this one's really unique having a face actually carved into it with the person's tattoos on it as well this one here i had the guy that made this for me do my chest tattoo which is kind of my uh personal symbol as well as my face here this one also is a, a blunt force weapon also used for swinging and things of that nature probably again around the head area because it's the most effective way to use this to um, take out your enemy so here we have a hatchet drew um it's, uh, it's a little disconcerting uh, in this area having a hatchet since we're not terribly far from where all that shit with Hannah Dustin went down. Um, but uh, what can you tell us about so, how this would be used? Hatchets are one of those tools, trade items that are recorded over and over and over and over again, starting from, you know, the 1620s all the way through into the 18th century. Uh, the style of this axe is known as a Biscayne, which is a French style axe. It's one of the most common 17th century axes we find throughout the Northeast. Um, it was a French style of trade axe, and it's known for this kind of sloping head. Now, what separates this from a true Biscayne, the handle haft here is wrong. It's actually, this is for a pole axe that's been modified. A true Biscayne would have more, if you've ever seen a Wetterlings or a Swedish axe, that kind of long but narrow, uh, tr almost triangular uh, haft to it. Um, but hatchets like these were also adapted to be used as war clubs as well. Uh, not only were they practical for cutting trees and cutting firewood and, and carving things and making things. Uh, you have to remember Eastern Woodland Algonquian people are wood, the men work with wood and carve wood. So hatchets are a very important item in carving wood and using things for woodworking but also are being used for combat. And Benjamin Church records this over and over and over again, these hatchets being used for combat. Native warriors' preferred way to dispatch enemies at close quarters was a swift and powerful single blow to the head, with a hatchet or a club, which was also used as a method of execution. This was often referred to in primary sources as a knocking on the head, which is a deceptively cute description of what was doubtlessly a shocking act of deadly violence. Benjamin Church, the English diarist and Captain Drew mentioned, described just one such execution carried out by one of the allied native soldiers under his command. The Indian Sam Barrow, who was as not a rogue as any among the enemy, fell into the hands of the English. Captain Church told him that because of his inhuman murders and barbarities, the court had allowed him no quarter, but he was to be forthwith put to death, and therefore he was to prepare for it. Barrow replied that the sentence of death against him was just, and that indeed he was ashamed to live any longer, and desired no more favour than to smoke a whiff of tobacco before his execution. When he had taken a few whiffs, he said he was ready, upon which one of Captain Charge's Indians sunk his hatchet into his brains. The same executioner would later use his hatchet to quarter King Philip himself, after Church's company finally caught up with the defeated Wampanoag Sachem in August of 1676. The harrowing captivity narrative of Englishwoman Mary Rawlinson is our most descriptive primary source depicting the brutality of indigenous melee combat in King Philip's war. In the narrative's opening pages, she describes the horrors she witnessed after the raid on her hometown of Lancaster, Massachusetts, as native warriors carried her and 24 of her neighbors away as captives. There were 12 killed, some shot, some stabbed with their spears, some knocked down with their hatchets. There was one who was chopped in the head with an hatchet and stripped naked, 
and yet was crawling up and down. I had often before this said that if the Indians should come, I should choose rather to be killed by them than to be taken alive, but when it came to the trial, my mind changed. Their glitter and weapons so daunted me spirit that I chose rather to go along with those, as I may say, ravenous beasts, than that moment to end me days. I think there's been great strides in the past 25, 30 years in scholarly research about King Philip's War, um, but I think public knowledge is really at a null. And I think it's very much at a null for a variety of reasons. One, it's a conflict that for an ever-changing demographic of people that are moving into New England, that are living in New England cities from all over the world now, and they don't know the 17th century history. Um, just because so much of the landscape has changed, many of the people that passed those oral traditions, whether they were native people, Europeans, those people have passed away and a lot of those town histories, you know, have shifted their focus and interest on other subjects. And it's a history, I think too, that hasn't been talked about, because it's ugly. It's not flattering to anybody, um, to native people, nor to Europeans. It's not flattering. Um, and I think that too has been something that has kind of kept it in just in academic scholarly circles. Drew's right. There's very little public awareness of early American history, especially indigenous history. I'm hoping that videos like this can try to rectify the unfortunate lack of public knowledge about King Philip's War and early colonial history in general. But it's an uphill battle. Most schools teach an oversimplified, mythologized version of these events. Hello, English man. I am Squatto. Perhaps we should strike a treaty between our peoples. And the public outreach of many of the most prominent museums and historical societies in New England are Eurocentric and badly outdated. Your family can come to Plymouth Plantation and be pilgrims for a night. You come here as your modern selves, check in and visit the sites for as long as you want. And then when the museum's closed, you can dress up as pilgrims in authentic pilgrim clothes and come here to the colonial education site. People are coming in and getting kind of this whitewashed, very sterile, very clean version of the story. The native side always seems kind of like an afterthought. And a lot of the time they want the happy-go-lucky stuff. They want it to be the, the first Thanksgiving and we all love each other and it's very happy and that's very much not the truth. Personally, for me, I would like to see more sites being open to interpreting the 17th century. More sites saying, we want to talk about King Philip's War. We want your input talking about King Philip's War. So I think for us, what's important is just to keep doing it and to keep bringing it into the public eye and not stop talking about it. And recognizing the sites where this happens, making note of the sites where this happened. And if someone says, oh, well, we want to put a parking lot here, maybe try to stop it, or at least go to town planning meetings and saying, listen, you need to recognize the history that's here and at least put a plaque or a marker or something, because this is, this is a homeland to people. This is ancestor on both sides. The history of King Philip's War is deeply tragic and maybe uncomfortable for some to hear, but people still need to hear it. You leave out one part of the history, and specifically this part, Native history, you know, you're not getting the full history, and without Native history, there is no history, right? right? And almost every single, in every single uh, case of Europeans coming and settling and colonizing the Americas, if Native people did not help them in their first time because they get here and they struggle very, very much and almost die in almost every situation, um, if the native people didn't help, there would be no America, there'd be no Canada. There's um, an African proverb that makes me think of this. It's uh, a coworker from Nigeria told me this. He said, um, a river that forgets its source dries up. And it's very, very true. <laughs>